Hello, everyone, and welcome back to TED Connects. Oh, thank you. If you're joining Thanks, us Ted. for the if you're joining us for the first time, we've been bringing you interviews all week with some of the world's greatest minds to help us make sense of this unprecedented moment that we're living in. I'm Whitney Pennington Rogers, TED's current affairs curator and one of your hosts. This week, thousands of you have tuned into these live events each day, and hundreds of thousands more have watched these interviews after the fact. We've really loved seeing your questions. They add so much to these conversations, so please keep them coming. In a few minutes, I'm going to disappear to work with our team behind the scenes to monitor our Facebook feed where you can leave some of your questions. I'll uh, work to figure out uh, which ones are the ones that we can bring back to our, our guest, and I will ask as many of them as I can during the live interview. Um, today, we're going to be touching on a subject that I think is top of mind for a lot of people. So I'd like to turn things over to the head of TED, Chris Anderson, who will introduce today's guest. Hello. Hi, hi Chris. How's it, how's it going today? Nice to see you again, Whitney. It's going pretty good here. Amazing days. That's good. That's great. We have sunshine here in, in the Northeast, which is nice. Um, so look, I, I am excited to introduce this guest because I've known Seth Berkeley for a long time. I, I count him as a friend. Um, he's, he's a man who has really devoted his life to the most profound questions about public health. Um, vaccines are extraordinary. They save millions of lives. The quest for a coronavirus vaccine is, I think, the biggest single question that the world faces now if we're going to get out of this. So um, it's it's just a delight to welcome Dr. Seth Berkeley to TED Connects. Come on in, Seth. Good good to see you there, Chris, and and delighted to be with you and and all of the TED community. Well, so look on on Tuesday, Bill Gates was here, and he mentioned that your organization, Gavi, is um, is is really at the heart of the quest for a vaccine. Um, so tell us a bit, just what, what, what is Gavi? So Chris, thank you for that. Um, what's interesting is that uh, 20 years ago, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary, uh, there were all these powerful new vaccines that were being used in wealthy countries. And the challenge is they weren't getting to the places that they could make the most difference, the developing world. So Gavi was formed as an alliance, WHO, the World Bank, the Gates Foundation, UNICEF, all working together to try to bring these vaccines to the developing world. And it's been very successful. We've launched 433 new vaccines in the most difficult countries in the world, in the Somalias and Yemens and DRCs and Nigerias. Um, but we've also set up emergency stockpiles for outbreak-based vaccines. So if there's an outbreak anywhere in the world of yellow fever or uh, things like cholera or meningitis and now Ebola, we have vaccines that are available to do that. And the last thing we are trying to do is build the health systems um, out to be able to deliver these vaccines, but also to make sure that we can pay attention to new diseases that pop up in different parts of the world. And just give us a sense of the scale of this. How many vaccines do you distribute in a given year? And how many lives do you believe that that may be saving? So, I mean, let me give you a macro number. We've immunized more than 760 million additional children, sorry, billion additional children, million, 760 million additional children, and have prevented more than 13 million deaths. We, um, on an average year, we give about a half a billion doses because we started out with six diseases, but now we vaccinate against um, 18 different diseases. Yeah, the scale of that is incredible. And um, amidst all the bad news that's happening, it's kind of amazing that this, this intervention, uh, you know, just saves, can save so many lives. I mean, help us understand what, what a vaccine is. So um, the original idea, the word vaccine comes from vaca or cow, and the observation made in the 1700s that milkmaids had beautiful skin, whereas everybody else had pockmarks from having gotten over smallpox. And the, and the concept was that she was getting infected with a zoonosis, that is, with naturally occurring cowpox, not smallpox. That then protected 
against smallpox. And it was tested in those days, could you artificially do that? They, of course, didn't understand virology. They didn't understand any of those issues. But what a vaccine is, is something that you give to artificially stimulate the immune system, hopefully to not make you sick. But then later on, when the body comes in contact with the real disease, it thinks it's already seen it and it is able to fight it off without making the person sick. sick. I mean, it's kind of a, a miraculous thing to me that they work that way, that some, you know, that your body is always there looking for these threats. And a vaccine, it, it, I guess the body perceives it as a threat and therefore arms itself against that threat, right? And then and that, that, that's what gives the protection. And so how, if, but is that why people are, some people are sort of irrationally, I will say, irrationally scared of vaccines and feel that they may be dangerous because they are kind of a threat that you're putting into your body in a very subtle way? Well, of course, when this first started, there were two ways to make vaccines. You could grind them up and inject them, so-called whole killed vaccines. So you took organisms and you got an immune response. And sometimes those organisms, even though they were dead, gave you a pretty whopping immune response. Your arms were sore, you got fevers. Then we moved to these weakened live viruses. And frankly, those are the best vaccines. That's what measles is. That's what yellow fever is. These are weakened viruses. They don't give you disease, but because they look like the natural viruses, your body gets protection. And frankly, you know, you get protection for your whole life. Today, because people are worried about side effects, we've begun to use molecular biology and use little bits of it. And, and therefore, um, you know, it's moved forward. But the reason people are mostly scared is because, frankly, vaccines have been so successful. You don't expect if you have a child or two children that those children are going to die of these diseases, unlike in the past when, you know, three or four out of your five or six or seven kids would die. So today people think, well, gee, these diseases aren't around. They're not that bad. And by the way, if I'm injecting these things, maybe they're not organic. Maybe it'll make my child cry. Maybe it'll make them sick and I don't need to do it. And, and that's the challenge. You don't want to scare people to death on how bad these diseases can be, but at the same time, you want them to understand that these diseases are serious and can cause really bad uh, uh, disease and sequelae. So yesterday you issued uh, a really powerful call for this sort of massive coordinated global response to uh, tackle the, the, you know, the search for a coronavirus vaccine. We're going to come to that in a bit because I, I, I think that's a very uh, exciting topic. Um, but I think we need, need some more background first. So I just I want to go back five years to when you stood on the TED stage and you held up two um, candidate Ebola vaccines. This was just a few months after Ebola had, had been terrifying the world. Um, you said, you know, we're, look, you know, it was basically amazing how quickly those vaccines had been developed. What what happened to them? So it's a great question, um, and let me tell a little bit of the story, but. At the end, um, there were two vaccines. One, it turned out, couldn't finish its testing because the epidemic died down. The other one was fully tested. It had 100% efficacy. We then went on to uh, work with manufacturers to produce that vaccine, at least temporarily, um, in, in an investigational form, just in case there were more outbreaks. There were, and those are the vaccine doses that we've used in the DRC in the last two outbreaks. 280,000 people have been vaccinated um, with this experimental vaccine. And today there is a licensed vaccine. And we are um, now um, procuring a stockpile, a global stockpile of a half a million doses. But, so but let me just say, let, let me just say, Chris, though, the reason what's interesting is that the reason they, they came so quickly at that moment is after September 11th, um, there was concern in the U.S. about bioterrorism. Remember, there were anthrax attacks. And so what happened was there was a list of agents, and Ebola for a short time was on that list of agents. So people started making vaccines. And then um, later on, they decided that I was not necessarily a good bioterrorism agent. So they, they dropped that off the list. But in the freezers were vaccines that had been started, and they were dusted off. And that's why we could move so quickly in that moment. And yet, how long was it from that moment on the TED stage with the candidate vaccine to actual deployment? So what happened was um, the, the epidemic began to go down. 
the clinical trial I told you about was done. It was a heroic clinical trial done by WHO, and it showed that it had these results. That epidemic then stopped. We didn't know if there were going to be more epidemics. It took another number of years for the to finish the work on the vaccine, to make sure it was pure, to figure out how to manufacture it at scale. It's during that period we put vaccine you know, away and had it available in case there were other outbreaks, and it turned out there were three outbreaks. One, one went away quickly, but there were two. I was there on day 13 of the second outbreak. We injected the vaccine, cases went up, then they went down and controlled it, and then this DRC in North Kivu outbreak, which really was terrible because it was in a war zone, and that's the one where we've been not only vaccinating in, in DRC, but in surrounding countries. Um, by the way, that is now, I believe, day 38 or 39 out of the 42 necessary to say it's over. We hope it is, um, and that would be, again, an enormous example of what vaccines can do, even in a very difficult setting. And yet, in one way, Seth, it's kind of shocking that the outbreak that happened at the start of um, 2015, end of 2014, that it, that it happened at all, because the world, like the world, has known about Ebola for a long time. The, the it was sequenced and so forth. A vaccine could have been developed and got ready for a possible outbreak. Why didn't that happen? Well, I mean, there had been 26 outbreaks before, but each one of them was small couple of hundred people or a couple of dozen people in the poorest African countries in the world. There was no market for it. People didn't know how to test it because they would just pop up and then go away. And so even though it was obviously a disease that potentially could spread, it had never really spread before. Of course, in West Africa, they didn't have a good surveillance system. It spread for three months before people identified that it was Ebola. And by that time, it was too late. It had spread. And so, you know, what's important about that lesson is that then caused huge disruption across Africa, across the world, because cases went to other places. And, um, you know, the challenge then was, and the reason we had to step in was because there still was no market. So the Gavi board said, we will put out $390 million. We'll put it out there and tell companies, we're open for business. We'll create a market. We'll buy the vaccine. And that led to companies be willing to um, uh, finish the investment to get us to where we are today. Right, right. So, I mean, it's a real paradox, right? In a way, that the, the very thing that makes vaccines so extraordinary, that they are, once they're developed, they are so cheap to administer. You know, for a few dollars, I guess, you, could, you can administer this dose that will save someone maybe a lifetime of, of illness or save, save their lives. Um, and yet, so much of medical research and, and invention and development is done by companies who need to see it like a, a revenue stream. And so they don't see it from, from those tiny little cheap things that might save a lot of lives. And so it's, it's like it's a real market failure that in this circumstance now, we, that's one of the things I, I guess you're thinking hard about. How on earth do we get around and avoid that market failure crippling the response this time? Well, first of all, one of the reasons Bill Gates likes vaccines is, in a sense, it's a little bit like software creation. You put a lot of money and effort into creating it, but once you've got it, you can produce it pretty cheaply and use it in, in different places around the world. I don't want to beat up the pharmaceutical industry here because they were heroic in Ebola, but I think realistically they are for-profit entities and they have to say to their shareholders, you know, somebody's going to pay for this or we're going to do it as a charitable thing. And if we do it as a charitable thing, they can't keep doing it. Since then, there is a new initiative called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. It was set up at Davos a few years ago, and its purpose is to try to make vaccines for the list of diseases that aren't yet known epidemics, but that can potentially be there. And the idea would be that using public sector money to get us prepared, of course, they've jumped in on this coronaviruses as well. Last thing is, of course, I'm not worried about on the coronavirus uh, um, uh, stage that, that this is a problem with not having a market. One of the challenges here is that there may be too big a market for this, and therefore, how do we make sure there's access for developing countries? All right, so talk about this virus, Seth. How is it different from Ebola? How challenging is it to create a vaccine for it? So what's interesting about coronaviruses is that they are animal viruses, probably primarily in bats. They jump into other animals sometimes, and then they jump into humans. So this is shouldn't have been a surprise. This is the third coronavirus that is um, that has jumped into human. We had SARS in early 2000, 
two. We had mayors, uh, you know, a number of years later, and, and now we have uh, this virus. What's interesting is there is a database that shows there are 30,000 some odd isolated coronaviruses in animals. And one of the things that people tried to do is say the way these coronaviruses work is they have a spike on them. They're called corona because they look like the sun. That spike is where it attaches to a certain receptor in people's lungs. And so somebody said, well, maybe we can begin to look at those spikes and see if they're similar to the human receptors and maybe we can predict. But the problem is people don't invest in, in those types of research. And, and of course, I think from given it's an evolutionary certainty, we're going to see this that we should be. But one other point about this is coronavirus has jumped into humans in ancient history as well. And so we have now about a third to a quarter of the common cold viruses are actually coronaviruses. And what's interesting about those is they don't make you deathly ill like these, but we also don't have long-term immunity to them. So you can get reinfected with these viruses after you know, 10 months, a year. And so that does raise an issue on vaccinology because you wanna, of course, ideally have lifetime immunity. The, the reason why we get reinfected is because the virus mutates slightly, and so it, it, it escapes the antibodies that no, no, develop. No, no, not in this camera. case. Not in this case. So in, in flu, that's what happens. The, you know, viruses are always mutating. In HIV, the reason we don't have a vaccine is because they're all mutating. In this case, the immune response seems to get weaker and go away, and people get reinfected with the same viruses. Now, that is, not, that is potentially a solvable problem using vaccinology and many different techniques, but the point is we just can't assume. And some people now are talking about herd immunity as a way to deal with this virus, and the idea there is if you could get enough people infected, you know, forget for a moment that a lot of people are going to die and be miserable while that happens, but the idea is then you get a, a certain level of immunity in the community and then the disease will go away. Well, that is only true if you get long-term immunity. If you don't, then you could go through all of that horrible experience, have all those deaths, and then not have the protection you need to protect against this disease. Okay, so in a way, the quest we're, we're looking for is a vaccine that will work for the long term and that I mean I, I mean I guess any any vaccine that works at all will be a, a huge gift but it, it, it could well be one that we have to retake every year or something like that. That is certainly possible of course we have to remember though that SARS and MERS both had even higher mortality than this virus does and they give a much more profound immune response so it may be that they react more you know differently than the common um, cold viruses. The challenge, of course, is is that you know we haven't had the opportunity to study these over a long time, and this new disease is three and a half months. We've had it. More science has been done for this disease in this short period of time, but we don't understand fully the epidemiology of the virus, the immune response, what's protective, which is the best animal model. All of that is being worked on by science, but um, and at 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 breath you know breakneck pace, but a lot to learn. So talk, so talk about how how you know the, the the medical and the research community responded because you know the chinese authorities i guess we heard it yesterday only found out about this in, sometime in december um already early in january i mean it, i think the virus they think the virus started in november they found out about it in december by early january they had already released a sequence of the virus to the world and now here we are and i think i think i saw that more than 40 companies are already claiming candidate vaccines. What does it mean to have a candidate vaccine? Like, have, have companies tested this already against animals or something? Or are they just looking at a computer model where they go, that should work? Well, it's an interesting question you asked there. So first of all, China was heroic on this. They did post the genetic sequence of it. Today, we have companies that can sit down with a computer and from that genetic sequence make what is a candidate vaccine. Now, a candidate vaccine obviously means it's not a licensed product. It's something that somebody wants to work on. But you're right. You have to have the right nomenclature because candidate can mean I'm working on something. It's in my head. I'm just doing a little work on it. I've got something in a vial. I'm beginning to do testing on it. And so what we saw in that case was um, a company called Moderna. That was the first vaccine that went into humans. It's a messenger RNA-based system. I actually visited the company, um, not in this outbreak, but before because the technology is interesting. And what they were able to do is in 42 days make a candidate vaccine from the genetic sequence. They didn't need the organism. That now is in clinical testing. 
Now, there is no licensed mRNA vaccine. So we're going to have to figure out, you know, is it safe? Is it, does it work in all different age groups? How are we going to scale it up? All that. But there are many others who are using conventional vaccinology. So an example would be the French are working on a measles based vaccine. So the idea is to put the spike protein in the measles vector. And it takes a little bit longer to do that work. But once you have that done, of course, we know how to make measles vaccine. Um, we've made, you know, we make uh, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of doses and provide it to the whole world. So if, you know, that was to work, that might be easier to scale up. So I think what we want in the race is to have multiple different vaccines moving forward. You know, we don't want one or two. We don't want a hundred in the late stages because it's expensive and hard to do, but we want to have diversity of science approaches going forward. Which of the other candidates out there are you excited by or at least intrigued by? Well, for me, the, the critical issue here is going to be we have to optimize for speed. And so that means, as I said, you know, having examples of all the different new technologies that could potentially work, as well as conventional doses moving forward at the same time. So what you're going to want to do is have this bubble up. And it's not just companies, it's or big companies, it's also biotech companies, it's also academic researchers that are working on this. You want all of those to bubble up, then you want to be able to, you know, look at what's the most promising, and that will depend upon animal results, it'll depend upon being able to produce those vaccines, have a pathway, and eventually you will want to put those into human clinical trials. That requires a certain amount of safety work, you can try to accelerate that, but then you need to say, okay, we need to know how, do we need one dose? Do we need multiple doses? Do we need, you know, 50 micrograms, 100, 150? Do we need a chemical stimulant we call an adjuvant? Given that this disease has, you know, it's, 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 it's big, you know, problems in outcomes or in the elderly, we might need to put some stimulants in to make it a more potent immune response. So all of that work has to go on. That's what the clinical testing is. Eventually you say, aha, here's the vaccine we're going to use. Now you test it in an efficacy trial. And that is to see, does it work? And, and at that point, you then have a vaccine that you know works, but there is a stage after that. And that stage is you've got to, you know, uh, work out the manufacturing, have it all worked out so that, you know, the regulators know that you can really make this and that it's pure, it doesn't have any, any, any problems with it. And during that period, and that's what we did in Ebola, we were able to use those vaccines to help in outbreaks, you know, under a clinical trial protocol while monitoring them and learning. So there's a lot of steps there and that's, and it's complicated. And I've shortened it. Just to summarize, summarize the steps, summarize the steps that they basically need to go through. I had like probably an animal, an animal test. And then, and well, then for, some for example, Moderna, Moderna did, you know, they went into humans at the same time they're doing animal testing. Um, we don't have a perfect animal model, but normally it takes 10 to 15 years to do this. And that's the compression you're trying to do here. So the challenge is we can compress all those different clinical trials. The basic way you think about it is preclinical studies, animals, understanding it, purity, you know, reproducibility. Then you move into um, human studies. You start off with a small number of healthy people. You then work on the dosing, how much, how often. Then you move into people at risk for the disease. That might be, in this case, the elderly or people with other conditions. And then eventually you do an efficacy trial. Now, one of the cool new things we can do today is something called adaptive trial design. So rather than do these, you know, sequentially, what you can begin to do is enroll people. And then as you get the data you need, you can just begin to bring in the next set of groups. And by doing that, you can speed it up dramatically. Right. When you say enroll people, you mean enroll people who have their eyes wide open. They, they, they have informed consent. I think that's the term. Absolutely. And, um, uh, and uh, they're willing to, I guess, take the risk. that This isn't a fully tested uh, vaccine, but uh, but it may well be efficacious. And um, and so that, that obviously can help uh, uh, a lot. Is that, that that's that's crucial to this, right? Absolutely. They are the Aung San heroes of vaccinology because people go out, they volunteer to take a substance, particularly early on, that don't know how it's going to react. Is it going to make the disease worse? Is it going to make it better? Is it going to protect them? Is it not? Is it going to make them sick? So you try to predict that if you can with animals, but um, people do do that. And the informed consent says not only you may have these side effects or these problems, but also 
this vaccine may not work. And so, you know, it's important for people to understand that um, because you don't want people to go and put themselves at high risk saying, oh, gee, I had a vaccine and so I'm protected. We don't know that until we get to the efficacy stage of trials. But Seth, even putting together all those all those dots, um, like what I've heard most people say um, is that it, it is likely to take at least 18 months before the world will have a vaccine available at, at any kind of scale. Um, is, is that timeline right? And can the world remotely afford 18 months on this? Well, I think, you know, I've given you many questions. I could raise lots more questions. So part of it's going to be luck. How easy is this particular candidate vaccine going to be? You know, how lucky will we be in getting a good immune response? Which approaches will work? Will they be scalable? So I think there's lots of questions there. The world will do everything they can to squeeze it down. Um, but I think that's the timeline we're talking about. And remember, it's 10 to 15 years. Usually in the case of Ebola, we did it in five years um, to a licensed product. In this case, we are hoping to squeeze it down dramatically. But, you know, there are many things we're going to have to go through. And it's and it's really about making sure that vaccine works and and um, it is safe for use in what ultimately may be billions of people. Whitney. Hi. Um, so we have lots of questions coming in, Seth. Um, one of them that's kind of related to this is, you know, a lot of us right now are isolating and we're not building our exposure to this virus. Um, so how will that affect us in the long term? Will this make us vulnerable to the virus until a vaccine is available? So, so that's a great question. And as you know, um, we don't fully understand the epidemiology of this virus, but there is some sense that there may be asymptomatics. Do they get immune protection? Are they afterwards, um, you know, resistant to infection? We don't know that, but we do know that people do get sick, including young people, and that sickness can be quite severe. Obviously, a lot of it is mild, but some of it's quite severe, and then it gets more severe in the elderly. So I wouldn't recommend that anybody go out and intentionally try to get exposed to this virus now. Um, the whole idea of having isolation now is to try to get, stop the chains of transmission um, protect health workers and hospitals with the idea being that if you can suppress it enough, and Bill talked about this in his talk, and, and later on have testing available, you might be able to go back to somewhat of a normal life and then watch for um, reintroduction of this virus. Of course, um, you know, at the end of the day, we will probably need a vaccine to be able to completely control that. But we, the experiment's going on in China. You know, Japan has done an amazing job of controlling this with slightly less severe um, um, interventions. We've seen in, in Korea similar things. So, you know, the hope would be that if we take it seriously, we actually you know, damp down the exposures and stop the, 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 um, this epidemic now, we'll be able to remove to some form of normalcy. Um, and, and we also may have drugs, and drugs will change the dynamics as well, because people will then know that they are able to get treatment as well. Great. I'll be back later with other questions I'm seeing. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks everyone watching. Keep those questions coming. Um, I mean, Seth, this timeline, like I, I've, I've been puzzled about this, because I, I get that there are so many things that you have to have to be checked out. but it's still, I, I, I worry that um, the rules are not adapting rapidly enough for the scale of the emergency. I mean, my, my analogy, you know, would be you know, you're going about your lives and, uh, and suddenly there's this emergency. You see that there's this enemy force approaching you from the horizon and coming your direction. You, you don't, in that circumstance, spend a week, you know, trying to test all your guns and make sure they're operating absolutely safely and in the right way. You know, you 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 galvanize and you and you do take some additional risk for the sake of avoiding the bigger risk. Is is that thinking pre prevalent right now? Are there people trying to make those kinds of trade offs? Um, how should we think about that? Or, or do you really believe that the that the community is galvanizing and moving forward as fast as it humanly can and and appropriately balancing the two risks? I think we're seeing heroics in moving forward here. I think, you know, obviously you're right. And the reason we talk about going from 10 to 15 years down to something like 18 months is about squeezing those steps as much as possible. The regulators in the Ebola experience were really fabulous. They worked with us and tried to keep 
any bureaucratic de delays down to you know the smallest amount possible and i and i think that's what's going to be important here is we have to look at every single step and say is it critical but you do need to answer a lot of these questions for example if you have a vaccine that's that works in healthy people it very well may not give an immune response in the elderly we may need to you know, change that vaccine to make it work there. We, um, you know, it may not work in young children. So you need a certain amount of the studies done. Of course, if you work in areas that have big outbreaks, you're able to also enroll more quickly and follow people more quickly. And that's one of the reasons we'll have to think about this globally, because we don't know in 12 to 18 months when, or even six to 18 months, if we're really lucky, where the epidemic will be raging and where we want to do the, the clinical trials. We should be prepared to do them wherever in the world it's possible and also do some in different types of countries. Developing countries may have different immune responses than in wealthy countries. I mean, what what's alarms me a bit is that on the models I've looked at, with the possible exception of what, what happened in China and Japan, what you can, by, by distancing, we can we can bend the curve, we can reduce infection, but as soon as you go back to normal, there's this the huge risk of a massive resurge. And it, until the vaccine comes along, it, it feels like your choices are one sort of kind of recklessly expose the whole population to the bug and develop some kind of herd immunity, or try and do this scary dance of really cramping down on the economy um, and all the risks that are associated with that. And, uh, and risking, you know, if, if you if you if you lift the lid on that, risking these sort of really dangerous second surges. So, I mean, is, is that the right way to think about it? There's there's a scenario where until this happens, and it might if it's 18 months, that's an incredibly long time for the world to be in that sort of dangerous, scary dance. Well, I think you know the the issue here is um, that is a little bit the way to think of it. But the experiment's going on now. China is now releasing its controls, and we will see what happens there. We'll see where they have to clamp back down and what's going to happen, and we'll get a good idea of what that's like. Right now, in many countries, we're still in the upscale period when we're seeing lots of cases, and so we have to break that transmission first before we can have that conversation. I'm the first person that would like a vaccine to occur quicker. And of course, you know, my job is to, you know, um, um, over, um, you know, under promise and over deliver, not the other way around. And I think that we have to be careful not to think about, oh, we can just have a vaccine in a couple of months. It may be that we're lucky. It may be that it's easy to do. It may be the first few candidates will show promise. We get efficacy. We can scale those up for at least some limited use while it's being worked out. But, but a lot of things have to fall in place for that to happen. And that's why we want to have an organized global effort to absolutely incentivize the best possible chance for that to happen in the fastest way. There's some kind of debate out, out there about whether there might be way, way more cases, mild cases, basically zero symptom cases of coronavirus out there that have, have uh, may have um, granted more people immunity than we know. Is that is that a credible suggestion? More cases and much lower fatality rate than we know because so many of the cases are be invisible. You know, Mayor Bloomberg used to have a saying that I loved. He said, in God we trust, everybody else bring data. And I think the answer here is we haven't done enough testing to know. And we started out with PCR tests to look for virus. And therefore, if you had recovered, didn't have the virus anymore, we weren't able to pick it up. Now there are beginning to be antibody tests to look to see if you've been exposed and, you know, don't have the virus now, but have an immune response to it. Once we have those tests, operating at scale, we'll be able to understand what the epidemiology is and what's happening, and then we'll be in a much better uh, place to understand how this is playing out. Also, I mean, even the question, we don't see a lot of cases in children. Is that because the children get infected, but they don't get symptoms, and therefore they might be potential spreaders, or is it um, because those children, you know, don't get it at all? So tell us, Seth, about this call that you issued yesterday. Um, I mean, you've said that scientists are behaving heroically, but you, you've called for something for something more here from both scientists, companies, governments. Tell us, tell us what your call is. So, first of all, I believe that given the situation here, this is not the the, the time to just let the normal system work, as we've talked about. I think we have to think about vaccines as a global public good. 
And, and what that means is that initially it ought to be public sector financed. Obviously, if others want to contribute resources, I believe they, you know, it should, they fine, but we want to make sure the best approaches come and it doesn't matter where they come from in the world. We want to make sure if the best approach is in China or Japan or in South Korea or in the US, wherever it comes from, whatever company has the ideas, get them on the table. Then we want a process to say, realistically, you know, how are these being compared? How do we decide which ones are most likely to succeed? And then, as I explained, some diversity in taking those risks, you know, maybe some new technologies, some old technologies to drive forward. Once that happens, then to try to get clinical trials to drive forward as quickly as possible. Now, the delay here is actually likely to be in manufacturing because, you know, we might want um, billions and billions of doses. So how do we then, you know, begin to invest at risk in manufacturing plans? If it's a big company, they may have adequate manufacturing, but you may want to work with contract manufacturers, other companies, or even build plants or use new technologies, modular technologies to do this. And then, of course, at the end is going to be the process of getting the vaccine out to all those who need it. And that's going to need to be dependent upon the risk at that time. Help me understand this better, Seth, because right now it feels like there's this huge effort going on, but companies are operating in, in a way competitively with each other. To an extent, countries are operating competitively with each other. Are you saying that what the world needs is, is some kind of widely supported global, I don't know, vaccine czar that, that is pulling together different efforts, coordinating, encouraging everyone to work together for the common good? and trying to get agreement on these big decisions like what is the smart way, what are the smart few candidates to get behind rather than this confusing explosion, and then how we coordinate manufacturing, et cetera. Like, is that, is that a person or a small organization that, that the, some combination of governments, WHO, UN, needs to put together? So, first of all, you want science to bubble up at the beginning. So, you don't want to have centralized control, you know, somebody saying, I know best and I'm going to predict this. So, you want it bubbling up from all over the place, but then you want a coordinated effort. The best, the, the group that is best placed to do that is the World Health Organization, maintaining a list of all the different programs that are going on. We also have other organizations. I mentioned CEPI before. CEPI has now supported eight different candidates. I, I think it's going to support more. Um, right now, WHO has on its list 44 candidates, but some people think as many as, as double that. So what you want to do is say, which are the most likely to succeed, and then put them through some type of standardized set of criteria to pick a few of them to move forward aggressively for the world. Obviously, science is going to keep moving. They're going to keep changing, and it may be that your original approach isn't right and new new ideas may come up, but you do need to have some process of moving this forward. And and really that's what I called for. And and um, what we need to make sure is, is that if, if companies have adequate resources to do this on their own, that's fine. But if not, they needed to be supported by the public sector. And again, making sure there's adequate manufacturing and ultimately distribution. Then after a period of time, we can go back to normal and return to the normal way um, uh, vaccines are, are handled. But I think that's probably the best way to get there. How much uh, might this cost and who should pay for it? Well, it depends how many cases there are. You know, the good news is we're talking now about um, trillions of dollars in economic loss. And this is going to be a program that's going to be in, in tens. Well, I mean, I'm making the comparison. Sorry, you're absolutely right, Chris. Um, I mean, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars here, not trillions of dollars. And, and the reason that's important is you want to make sure that any good idea has its best chance of moving forward. And, and we ought to, we ought to, you know, again, optimize for speed and not optimize for being cost effective at this time. So, so I, I guess. Um, you're saying that like, the rich countries may well be able to afford some kind of vaccine program. I think what I hear you doing here is representing a lot of the countries that can't afford it. And what you're saying is that the world may have to find a way of spending great tens of billions of dollars to avoid trillions of dollars of economic damage and all the hardship that goes with it around the world. Is that, is that about right? That's absolutely right. But I think the important point is 
This needs to be a global perspective. I mean, look at what happened with Ebola. We had a vaccine that was originally made in Canada by the Public Agency of Canada. It was then transferred to a U.S. biotech, then to a Merkin company, which is obviously a global player based in the U.S., and they're manufacturing it in Germany. That's the way science works, and these vaccines may need components from other places. So how do we think about this in a global way and make sure that, by the way, the second vaccine that's in humans is from China. Of course, they've had a you know, a lot of uh, time to work on it compared to some others. And, you know, they have a candidate that's moving forward. If that candidate is successful, we want to make sure that's the one that's scaled up. And so, you know, for me, it's making sure that we're, we're, we're looking at this as a global ecosystem with the best candidates moving forward for the good of the world. Wendy. So we, we have a lot of people watching from all over the, the world and we're seeing questions, especially from some of our friends in, in India who are watching, um, connected to this, just basically about how are poor nations going to get access to this vaccine? And then specifically, when we think about who gets the vaccine first, um, will there be some sort of uh, payment that where people are paying for this vaccine and those who can afford it get access before others? Well, the decision on who will pay for it will ultimately come from the political leaders. And my recommendation would be, as you start off as a global public good, you make the vaccine available because we're trying to stop the epidemic. Later on, we can have tiered pricing in different places. But one of the concerns, of course, is where is the epidemic going to be at that point and who needs it first? Now, I would argue the people that will need it first are probably health workers because health workers are going to be on the front lines and you want them to be there to be able to take care of people. They're at risk of both contracting it as well as spreading it. Um, then you probably want to think about the high risk, you know, individuals, you know, the elderly, people who have pre-existing conditions, and then eventually the rest of the population if it's needed. So having some type of way of thinking about that, we also need to be thinking about equitable access. And that is going to mean thinking about the entire world. Now, as Gavi in the past, including in India, has worked to make sure these new technologies are there. But, you know, these are vaccines that existed. And, and in this case, it's a new vaccine. We have to make sure that it isn't um, hoarded only in wealthy countries or in a select set of countries. And that one way to do that would be to have vaccine production in multiple places. So today, a lot of the vaccine that Gavi uses are made around the world. Some are made in, in the United States and Europe, but some are made in South Korea, in India, in China, in other countries. And so what we could do is have a vaccine transfer the technology and manufacturing in multiple different sites so we can have enough vaccine for that original launch. But whatever happens, there will always be a period of time when we'll have an exciting vaccine and not enough doses to go around. And that's when we need to take hard decisions based upon science on who should get it. Thanks for that, Seth. I'll, I'll be back later with other questions. Thanks, Whitney. Thank you. How confident are you that we'll, we'll eventually get one? I mean, we still don't have a vaccine for HIV, uh, nor for the common cold. Um, how can you be confident that we can get one this time? Well, first of all, um, as you know, I did a TED talk uh, even before the one of 2015 talking about HIV and, and flu and how new science needs to come in. And frankly, we are making progress against some of these incredibly difficult organisms. You know, you talked about variability. That's the problem with HIV. It's constantly changing. And so, you know, you're chasing, the, you know, you get a good immune response, but it's to the strain that was there before. And now you're chasing new strains. There are ways to work around that. It's new science. I actually, I am optimistic. I'm optimistic because we have some experience with SARS vaccines and with MERS vaccines. And so people have worked on it. They've been able to get good immune responses in animals and in people for those vaccines. And so we can build on that experience. I mean, I, I can't tell you how long they'll last for, how effective they will be. Will they need to have local mucosal immunity, which is in the mouth and nose, as well as serum immunity in the, in the bloodstream? Um, will they need to have just antibodies or the other arm of the immune system, the cellular uh, arm? These are questions that they'll need to be answered, but I am a great believer in the power of science, and I think in this case, the organism is not going to be um, quite as difficult as the ones you're talking about that are, are much more difficult. You mentioned in your TED Talk five years ago, Seth, that um, we've got this situation where we're spending billions of dollars on nuclear submarines, you know, patrolling the oceans for a possible incoming threat, nuclear war threat or, or whatever. 
and, and almost nothing on um, preparation for a pandemic like the one we're suffering. If the world is adequately shaken up by what's happening now and, and uh, gets rational about this, what, like, what, what is the key sort of structural shift that would be the pandemic equivalent of having those, those nuclear submarines? How, how do we prepare for a new um, virus that we don't know what it will be or when it will come? How do we prepare to have a much more rapid response? Well, it's a great question, and I think the TED community has a role to play here. So, first of all, we need better surveillance. We need surveillance everywhere in the world, and that's why we don't want to have another outbreak like in West Africa with Ebola. You want to have a resilient health system in every country that reaches out to the periphery, and that's an important priority. We're doing pretty good with immunization. We reached 90 percent of the kids in the world with at least one dose of routine vaccine. That's the best of health interventions, but we need to reach that last 10 percent and put that health system in place. Then we need to have a different view. We need to start working where are likely hotspots, where, you know, it's where we're cutting down forests, it's where in urban slums, where there's density of populations, it's with climate change and movement of different vectors. And what we need to do is use predictive science, and that's where big data can help, that's where AI can help in terms of trying to do that. And we need to have a one health approach because we tend to think of animal diseases. And by the way, people have worked on coronavirus vaccines for animals because they also cause disease there. We need to make sure that the scientists working on veterinary vaccines are connected to humans, are thinking about this whole ecosystem. And we need to invest in that. And, and unfortunately, after an epidemic, we have all this, everybody wants to invest and they say, whatever it takes, and then they just, you know, it, uh, we move on to other things and investments go down. What's different about the military is that there is a baseline of investment that goes on all the time and nobody questions that. It continues and, and that level of preparedness needs to be there. Bill Gates in his talk and in TED when we did that back to back said, look, you know, the military are doing war games. They're constantly testing. They have all this preparatory activities. Why are we not doing that in diseases? And as you know, since then, there has been some war games, and they basically said we weren't prepared. And I think we're seeing now that, in fact, we are not as prepared as we could be. So my hope, the silver lining, would be that we prepare for the next big outbreak, because it's absolutely evolutionarily certain we will continue to have outbreaks. The question is, is how prepared are we to deal with those? And as we wait for a vaccine, are there other interventions that could be made? For example, you know, the serum, from people who have been infected and have recovered? So that technique has been used in other infectious diseases and throughout history and even in Ebola recently. Um, that's something that could potentially be done. Of course, today it's more attractive if you can make antibodies in the laboratory and then have those available at scale and use those. And I know of a lot of companies that are now working on producing those antibodies, which could be infused in, a, in, a, in an emergency situation and do that. Um, obviously, drugs may play an important role here. There's a similar effort to try to create drugs that are active against this organism. And, you know, if we knew that you'd get sick, but there was an effective treatment, that would also change a little bit of the dynamics of, of, the, of the fear that exists around this pandemic. So I think there are lots of interventions. Of course, traditionally, a preventive vaccine is the best way to deal with these types of epidemics. So paint us, in an optimist in me, begging for something. Paint us the best case scenario, Seth. I, I, lots of people listening. I don't think we you know we don't want to be huddled in our homes by ourselves for 18 months. Lovely though the internet is. Um, what, what's what's <laughs> what's the best case scenario? Putting all the pieces together here. Well, I mean, I think what is likely to happen, but I don't want to predict because we're in unprecedented times here. What's likely to happen is that countries will, who don't take this seriously will have severe outbreaks. Those that really take it seriously and put these extraordinary um, mechanisms in place will control the disease. It'll take some time. It'll take, you know, this is weeks, maybe months, not years to do that. And then you end up with a situation where the disease is controlled and you then can go back to life as normal with some cautions around it. You know, now there's beginning to be new tests that are going to be home tests. We're going to be able to, you know, figure out whether classrooms, regions, countries have disease. 
we can go back to some level of normalcy. But one thing that's really important is we can't have areas of the world with raging disease. So for example, if people said, oh, you know, we're not worried about Africa, we're only worried about our countries, you might end up a situation where you have large numbers of infections, the virus is mutating, it's actually adapting to humans, we saw some of that with SARS, and then it is easy to reintroduce, so what you'd want to do is damp it down everywhere in the world. And, you know, maybe it'll burn out, maybe that'll be it. Um, I personally think we'll probably need a vaccine, but, you know, best case scenario is that those alone will stop the epidemic and what we'll need is then a vaccine just in case it comes back. But of course, um, I, if I was a betting man, I'd say let's get a vaccine as soon as possible because that's the way to, best way to control a, a viral infection, particularly one that is spread respiratory. Yeah, it's so interesting what you said there. Like the vaccine doesn't know what continent it's on, what country it's in. It just does its thing. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> So, so in terms of like people listening here, like what kind of psychological advice can you give them? What, what should expectations be? Like, do we have to be ready to settle in for the long haul here, or should we be looking forward to getting back to business around about Easter time and celebrating? Well, again, I don't want to put a timeline on it like others do. What you're going to want to see is that bending of the curve. Um, you know, I think Bill talked about this. You want the reproductive rate below one, you want to get it way below one if you can, and then to begin to see the disease spread. And what you don't want to do is, in the middle of that, jump out and start having parties. You know, it's not time to go on spring break and, and, and start mixing again. But with, you know, careful control, you can begin to release the controls if that's what, you know, science shows us. And I think the most important thing here is we need the data to tell us that. That's why testing is so important. With the wide availability of testing, we'll be able to you know, keep tabs, know what's happening. We'll know how many people are asymptomatic, what's happened. We'll know, you know, where there are hot communities and we'll be able to deal with this is my prediction. So I don't think this is over a very, very long time, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't rush it during this unprecedented moment. Otherwise, we're going to end up seeing what we saw in Italy or we're seeing in New York right now is overwhelming of the health system. Yeah, no kidding. New York is a scary place right now. Um, I was out walking today. I hope that was okay, but there was no one. There was no one like you. Like you couldn't get within six feet of someone if you tried. Right now, that on the like the busiest walk spots, and I. I mean, that was nice to see, but man, it's 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 um it's startling. And um, I, I mean, recent I, data has shown that you you know you can droplets can spread the disease, and so people are rightfully being cautious. And, you know, we didn't know that. You remember when we started, we said it's a point estimate out, it's point outbreak out of Wuhan, wet market. You had to be in the market to get the disease. Then it was, all right, if you were with sick people, you got the disease. Then it was maybe asymptomatics. I think, you know, as we understand better, that gives us the tools to do the right thing. Do you think the, um, the, there's a debate out there that seems to be growing again about masks, like the, 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 the East and West have taken very different advice on masks. It's, it's, uh, we were hearing from Gary Liu yesterday that everyone in Hong Kong and China is basically wearing masks and, and arguably that has been affected. Has the, the advice in the West against not wearing masks, is that, how much has that been driven by just the fact that there's a shortage of masks and that if anyone needs to wear them, it's medical professionals? Um, I mean, I guess it, it, if, if it's water droplets, it seems like masks could be effective in prevention. I mean, the most the most important intervention, as you know, is some isolation and then very careful hand washing or use of sanitizers. And because what happens is you touch your face, I forget the number, I think it's like, you know, um, every one to two minutes and you touch your eyes. So if you reach a door handle or you have contact with a surface and we know the virus can live on those surfaces and then you touch your face, touch your mouth, you know, touch your nose, you can spread it. So the purpose of a mask for a person who's not infected is not so much to keep them from getting infected. It is to keep them from, you know, touching their face. And so I think what's interesting here is um, you know, how do we get people to have this personal sanitation? If we have unlimited quantities of masks, people want to do it as a way to, to um, you know, to remind themselves not to touch their face. Now, that's very different if you're infected, because if you're coughing, having a mask on does reduce the spread of 
of, um, of droplets, and that's why um, they recommend it. Um, uh, you know, in a in a situation where somebody is infected and has to go to the hospital or has to go out and, and be seen. Yeah, I was touching my face all through the Bill Gates interview, apparently, and uh, I got got called to task by our online friends, which was which was very nice. I don't know if I've been doing that today. It's funny you're unconscious of it. It's weird. Wouldn't yes, you? no, it's. It's automatic, and in fact, I, I did a, um, there was a WHO challenge for safe hand washing, and I did a video, and I left my water running while I did it, and my, my <laughs> friends in the developing world came to me and said, you know, I live in Switzerland, where, you know, I'll buy a lake where we have, you know, a lot of water, and I wasn't careful, and they were absolutely right, so it's, it's really good we correct each other. That's an important point, and help each other in doing this to um, get us to as as um, be as compliant as we possibly can for these issues. Whitney. Yep. I mean, so feedback online is overwhelmingly positive. You're really uh, answering all of everyone's questions out there, and people really appreciate what you're sharing, Seth. Um, I think one big question is is just for folks who are watching from home and maybe who are not part of of your community um, in, in terms of the, the science community, um, you know, how can they contribute to this global response effort? How can they do something to advance this? That's, that's a great question. So first of all, I think it's really important that citizens support leaders who are, are, are following science, are using science and are, and are, you know, because as you know, sometimes political leaders say, well, I don't want to do this because, you know, it's not good for my image or it's not good for the economy or it's not good for whatever. And I think you want to have all of your decisions taken by science, understanding that they're not the best science. So citizens need to applaud, even if it's a tough decision that politicians take for the good based upon science, that's a good thing. The second thing that really would be helpful is, is this concept. How do we keep, you know, our, our world focused on the fact that you know, that, that these, these epidemics will occur. Um, another example I didn't answer, which, which Chris, you know, and when he asked me about what could be done, we talked about this idea of platform technologies. These are vaccines that you can test, get them all ready, and then when a new organism occurs, you could put it in there and you know how to manufacture it, how to scale it up. These types of things can be done. CEPI is trying to do that now, but the challenge is if we, a year after this, go down to having no money available for these types of issues, that will be a problem. So what you need is citizens to say, I understand now that, you know, health is precious and I want my government, you know, my leaders to invest in this, in the science, in the ways of working so that we will be as safe as we can be going forward. And I, I think I can't emphasize enough how important a message that is for citizens everywhere in the world. Hey Whitney, stay stay on as as we wrap up here. Um, the um, I, I, I guess what what I'd like to give you a chance to do, Seth, as we as we wrap this up, is just to like look at the camera and make make your call to the world's leaders, companies, <laughs> politicians, scientists, citizens. Um, how how do we move forward? What's how would you wrap this up? So. From my perspective, what we need is the world to come together at this moment, not to talk about, you know, our national programs, not to talk about our science are the best and, and they may be the best, but how do we as a world pool our best science, our best resources, our best ways of working, our best manufacturing, our best clinical trials to move this forward as fast as possible? The WHO is a global organization whose job is this normative function, and we can, you know, get scientists to help them make sure that that normative function is as strong as it can be. We can get the leaders of the world to come together and put the resources in place, given the cost it's having on the economy. This will be a real bargain to invest in it. But what we need is to have that mindset of having science drive us and to make sure that we have no barriers in stopping that science going forward. That's my request to the world, and I think we can do it, and if we do that, we will end up seeing the power of science, which will give us the tools we need to either stop it, hopefully it'll be stopped by then, but stop it, and then prepare us for the next one. Mm. Powerfully said. I have to say, Seth, it's, it's incredibly encouraging to know that there are people like you out there in the trenches, but, you know, trying to coordinate this immense and crucial effort on behalf of, uh, of all of us. And also that, um, that there's an organization out there, that your organization is 
you know, has is tasked to carry any effective vaccine to the, the many billions of people who, who may live in countries that, that can't afford, you know, to pay the same prices that the West can pay. I mean, that's 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 really cool that you're doing that. And thank you so much for explaining so clearly to us what the situation is. Um, I, I, I guess I speak for the majority of people listening to say all power to you um, with, with pulling these threads together. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Seth. And thank you, Chris and Whitney and, and uh, the TED community for all of your support over the years. And, you know, let's continue to use science and technology for the good of the world to solve problems like this. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Well, well Whitney, I, that was great. <laughs> that, that, was, that was wonderful. I, I learned so much from this conversation. It seems like everyone online also really did. Uh, which was helpful. And I'd like to remind everyone that uh, if you miss part of this interview, you can watch it on our Facebook page as soon as we finish. And then also, and I'm going to read the link, it's go.ted.com backslash TED Connects. So our Facebook page or go.ted.com backslash TED Connects. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we, um, you know, we get the sense people literally all over the world and in so many different circumstances. Um, and yet, you know, we're, we're, this this moment has you know given us a new excuse to bring you all together. It's it's um, part of me, even though I, I, you know, you really could wish that we weren't in this situation, but um, it does give us a chance to explore some ideas in greater depth than we're normally able to. To have these conversations, you know, these are not 15-minute talks on a red circle. There, you can you can just go. A little bit deeper, and um, there's there's something really cool about that that I think we want to do more of, and we want to figure out how to you know how to hear from you and include you and make sure that your questions and your thoughts are coming in um, as we speak. We're we're dreaming up what speakers to bring next. Um, we know about Friday. We don't necessarily know beyond that, but watch this space. So Whitney, talk about what's going to happen tomorrow. So we're, we're really excited. We're going to have uh, Priya Parker on to round out the week for us. She is the author of The Art of Gathering, and she's going to give us some really helpful tips, I think, about how we can stay connected during this time, which is something I'm sure all of us are are struggling with as we're trying to practice social distancing and, uh, you know, are, are just spending more time physically apart. So um, going into the weekend, that feels like the type of thing I think all of us can really benefit from hearing. If you've um, If you've got value from this, conversation, uh, consider sharing it, sharing the link, those links with um, people you know. That would be cool. Um, and um, hang in there, everyone. These are hard days. Uh, we know many people are struggling hugely. Hang in there. We'll get through it together somehow. Um, and until tomorrow, take care. Bye for now. Take care, everyone.